We're at Standard 8 now. We're trucking right along, getting a little closer to the Civil War. I know you're all excited about learning a bit about that. But before we do that, let's find out why the North and South divide. Why? Why are they going to divide? Why can't we just be one big old happy country all living together? Well, there's some major reasons. And here we go. Let's find out. All right, let's begin our discussion here. All right, the years, 1820. We're at 1820. All right, so there's still going to be a lot of racial discrimination against African Americans. All right, slavery had largely ended in the North. All right, and many Northerners and some Southerners took up the cause of what's called abolition. All right. And what happens is this becomes a campaign to abolish or get rid of slavery immediately and to grant no financial compensation to those slave owners. Do you see some trouble that happened? Who's getting mad? These Southerners are like, I don't know about this. Now, as most slaves were held in the Southern states, abolition was a significant issue that led to growing hostility between Northerners and Southerners. Now, prominent abolitionists included African Americans, obviously, whites, men, and women. All right, and we're going to talk about well, three or four of them. Here we go. All right, our first abolitionist, his name is going to be William Lloyd Garrison. All right, he may be the most important of all these. He wrote a newspaper called The Liberator. He basically spoke out of sla against slavery and wanted to give African Americans not just freedom, but also full citizenship. He did this for about 35 years, and he's very passionate about it. So basically what he's going to say is this, is that he not only was going to be a crusader for the emancipation of slaves, that he was also going to work, now hear this, for their citizenship. So he sees them completely as equals. All right, there's a little bit from that newspaper. I'm going to read just a little bit to you. He said this, On this subject, I do not wish to think, speak, or write with moderation. No! No! For example, tell a man whose house is on fire to give moderate alarm. Don't be too excited. Or how about tell a, a man whose wife is being raped? To, to not, no, don't care that much. Or how about, how about I tell a mother that her uh, a baby is falling on the fire to just relax, it's okay, we'll get him eventually. He says this, I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. And I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. That's William Lloyd Garrison. Our next abolitionist, or person who had liked to get rid of slavery, was a slave himself. His name is Frederick Douglass. He escaped from slavery, became very prominent in the North, actually a very good friend of Abraham Lincoln. Um, he was actually hired by William Lloyd Garrison, who we just met. Remember, William Lloyd Garrison wrote The Liberator that newspaper. And then Frederick Douglass also wrote his own newspaper called The North Star. Great way to remember that is that the North Star is what the slaves would look at and so they would know what direction they were going as they escaped in the, uh, from the, in the Underground Railroad. As they went north, they would look at the North Star. So Frederick Douglass called his newspaper The North Star. All right, here are a few quotes of Frederick Douglass as he says this. I prefer to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others. He also said this, If there is no struggle, there is no progress. In this classroom, if you're not like having a little hard time, you really aren't learning much. So struggle just a little bit. It's okay. It's good for you. And lastly, he says this, People might not get all they work for in this world, but they must certainly work for all they get. Pretty good. Work for the things you get. Frederick Douglass. Now, let's meet one more. 
Okie dokie. Now let's look at two more abolitionists. They are sisters. We have Sarah and Angelina Grimke. All right. Uh, basically, their story goes like this. They are southern girls born on a plantation where there's many slaves. They become Quakers, and they leave the south, and they begin to go to the north and begin to preach against the plantation system. And that's basically the system that keeps the slaves working hard down in the south. They preach about the cruelty of it. Um, they, uh, they have a lot of quotes that are fun and everything. Here's one of them. He said, they, they say this. I recognize no rights but human rights. I know nothing of men's rights and women's rights, for in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female. It is my solemn conviction that until this principle of equality is recognized and the embodied in practice, the church can do nothing effectual for the permanent reformation of the world. So they not only fought for slaves to be free, but they fought for men and women and the church's minds to be opened up to equality for all. Sarah and Angelina Grimke, known as the Grimke Sisters. Okay, let's talk about one more abolitionist who's kind of very unique in this. This person is actually still a slave. His name is Nat Turner. He's going to uh, fight slavery by putting on a rebellion. We'll call it Turner's Rebellion. Nat Turner or Turner's Rebellion. All right, so he is an African-American preacher. All right, and his owner or his master sees that he has above average intelligence, teaches him to read and write, and learns leadership skills. So he believes that his mission on earth was to free his people from slavery or to emancipate his people from slavery. All right. Seen an 1831 solar eclipse as a message from above. So he has this vision as the eclipse is happening that it's a message from God that he will lead a rebellion. Him and some followers, they attack four Virginia plantations. They slaughter brutally 60 white men, women, and children. Before he is captured, tried, and then executed. So the result of this, or the impact of this, is basically, you know, we're going to have to stop such uprisings. We don't want these uprisings happening anymore. So white leaders... They join together and they pass new laws to limit the activities of slaves. This begins to strengthen the institution of slavery. So Nat Turner, he actually may have caused more harm than he did good. But anyways, Nat Turner and Turner's Rebellion, the vicious, brutal massacre of whites. Okay. Now, around 1820, 1830, as we're getting closer to 1861, which is the Civil War, we're going to see that uh, slavery is going to become a very uh, um, major political issue. So this is one example of how slavery is a political issue. Basically, what you have here is this. Most white Southerners opposed abolition. That's pretty obvious, all right? Most writers, or excuse me, most white writers... And public speakers argue that slavery was a necessary part of life in the South. The Southern economy, they said, was based on large-scale agriculture. It would be impossible to maintain without slave labor. Okay. So they also boasted that the Southern white culture was highly sophisticated and said it was made possible by the plantation system. All right. Another pro-slavery argument claimed slaves were treated very well and lived better lives than those factory workers up there in the north. They have horrible lives, but our slaves live very well in the south. All right. So, in fact, some whites said they provide better lives for slaves than free blacks were able to provide for themselves in the north. All right, when settlers in the slave-holding Missouri territory sought statehood, pro-slavery and anti-slavery politicians made slavery a central issue in national politics. 
So thus we'll come up with what's called the Missouri Compromise of 1820. So basically it says this, the state constitution proposed by Missouri allowed slavery. Makes the South pretty happy, the North very unhappy. All right, because half the states in the Union allowed slavery, while the other half did not, statehood for Missouri would upset the U.S. Senate's equal balance between pro-slavery and anti-slavery senators. The South's happy. The North's like, oh, no, we can't do this. All right, this issue will be resolved when Congress passed the Missouri Compromise. All right, this said, Maine would be admitted to the Union as a free state. Missouri would be admitted to the Union as a slave state. And keeping that balance of power in the Senate. All right, once again, half the states would allow slavery, while the other half did not. And the Senate would retain its equal balance between pro-slavery and anti-slavery senators until the next state has to enter the Union. This is going to be an ongoing problem. Let's see what happens. All right, our next big crisis that will lead to the Civil War is going to be named just that, a crisis. But it has another word with it. We call it the nullification crisis. All right, basically what happens is this. Vice President John C. Calhoun argued with President Andrew Jackson about the rights of states to nullify or to cancel federal laws they opposed. All right. Trouble known as the nullification crisis resulted when southern states sought to nullify a high tariff, which is just a tax, Congress had passed on manufactured goods imported from Europe. It became known as the Tariff of Abominations and also the Tariff of 1828. Alright, this tariff helped northern manufacturers. So the people in the, in the north were happy because they were getting more money. But it hurt southerners. Southerners are mad. No! You're taking our money! Alright, so legislatures nullified the tariff in South Carolina. All right, Calhoun quits his job as Vice President of the United States, goes on back home to South Carolina. So he resigns the Vice Presidency. Imagine what Andrew Jackson's thinking. His buddy just like, like just took off, just left, quit his job. Quit the second most powerful man, maybe on the earth at his time's job, is going back down to the South to help lead this crisis or this nullification crisis, all right? So, um, his loyalty to the interests of the southern region or his section of the United States, not the United States as a whole, contributed to the rise of this sectionalism when we have the North and the South having different beliefs. All right, so John C. Calhoun and other advocates of sectionalism argued in favor of what's called states' rights. Can a state overturn or get rid of, because they have the right, northern laws, or excuse me, federal laws. All right, The United States have certain rights and political powers separate from those held by the federal government and the federal government that they may not violate. The supporters of sectionalism were mostly southerners, obviously. Their opponents were afraid that if each state could decide for itself which federal laws to obey, the United States would simply just kind of just fall apart into sectional discord and possibly even warfare. And guess what? The opponents of nullification or the opponents of states' rights, they were right. It will lead to warfare. And you all know what that war will be. It will be the Civil War. The next big issue or dilemma we'll have will again be over land. Much like Missouri and Maine, this will be again over land. And what do we do with the land that we got from Mexico? So here's the year. It's 1845. The United States took Texas into the Union and set its sights on the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California. All right. U.S. annexation of Texas and other factors led to the war in 1846. During the conflict, the United States occupied much of northern Mexico. 
When the United States eventually won the war, this region was ceded to the United States as part of the treaty of called Guadalupe Hidalgo. Okay, so basically what I just said is this. The United States is going to take a bunch of land from Mexico. Basically, we had a lot of immigrants going, white immigrants going into Texas and to the California and the New Mexico Territory. And all these whites were there like, hey, we want to be uh, our own place. We'll be a part of the United States. So basically, long story short, the Americans go down there, fight, we kick some butt, we take this land, it becomes the America. We actually pay for the Mexicans for a, a, a lot of it, uh, but it ends up being ours, all right? Now, what do we do with the land? One idea was this. It's called the Wilmot Proviso. The Wilmot Proviso deals with the Mexican War. If I get that, Wilmot Proviso deals with the Mexican War. It does not pass, but it's the Wilmot Proviso deals with the Mexican, the land from the Mexican War. All right. Uh, Congress, they began to debate whether slavery would be allowed in this new territory. All right, and under the Wilma Proviso, the land would all be free. Everybody's free with all this land from Mexico, making the North very happy <clears throat> and the South very small, mad. What do you mean? Why can't these places vote? Well, the Wilma Proviso did not pass, but it just caused more, what's that word? Sectionalism. The northerner folks don't want to have any type of agreements at all. All right, there's the Wilma Proviso and the land that we got from Mexico. All right, so let's use a map a little bit. Now, here is the land that we got from uh, the Mexican War, right here in yellow and green. And now I'm going to tell you what actually did happen. The Wilmot Proviso did not pass. All it did was just make each, the North and South not get along even more. So here we go. During the 1840s, many members of Congress became increasingly concerned that the issue of slavery, especially its extension into the new states, threatened the survival of the nation. Those who favored slavery and those who opposed slavery therefore agreed to five laws that addressed these concerns. Five laws, remember that. Collectively, the five laws are known as the Compromise of 1850. This compromise is going to have five parts, and here they are. So remember, the Compromise of 1850 has five parts. Compromise of 1850 has five parts. Okay, first we have this. The state of New Mexico would be established by carving its borders from the state of Texas. So basically we have New Mexico is made. Number two, New Mexico voters could now vote to decide whether New Mexico would be free or slave. So we have New Mexico, now we get to decide is it gonna be free or slave. Three, California would be admitted to the country as a free state. So we have Mexico is made, they get to vote, California's made free. The fourth one, we have Washington, D.C. will no longer allow the buying and selling of slaves, but they will let the slaves that are already there basically remain slaves. So here we go again, Compromise of 1850, the four parts here. We have first, Mexico is made. Mexicans get to decide if whether they're going to vote for slave or non-slave. California is made. D.C., they no longer allow the buying and selling of slaves, but they can keep the slaves they have. And then the last one, the only one that will make the South happy is the Fugitive Slave Act. If slaves escape from the South and they go to the North, they must be returned. And if you are harboring those slaves, you will be fined. And you might be even imprisoned if you keep those slaves. So here we go. The Compromise of 1850, the five parts. Here we go is we have the Fugitive Slave Act. It makes the South really happy. We make New Mexico. We let them vote. We make California free. We make Washington, D.C. stop buying and selling them slaves. But they can keep what they already have. And lastly, again, we have the Fugitive Slaves Act. Any questions about the Compromise of 1850? So here are some questions for thought. What slave thought God wanted him to stop slavery by killing? We all know that. That is Nat Turner. Next, what is an abolitionist? Someone who wants to stop slavery. 
All right, what an abolitionist wrote an anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. There you go. The name is William Lloyd Garrison. Good job. What free black abolitionist wrote The North Star? There he is. The famous Frederick Douglass. What abolitionist sisters moved to the north to speak out against the plantation system? That would be the Grimke sisters. Yeah. Hello, pretty lady. All right. The Missouri Compromise made Missouri a slave state and Maine a free state, keeping the balance of free and slave states. The nullification crisis was an issue dealing with what? Oh, my gosh. What? what oh, my gosh. It is states' rights. Can they nullify laws? What former vice president led the nullification crisis? Ah! His name is, that's right, John C. Calhoun. After the war with Mexico, what did the Wilmot Proviso do? Made a bunch of people mad, but basically wanted all the land gained to be free, making the South mad. What are the five parts of the Compromise of 1850? Here they are. The Fugitive Slave Act, California's free, made New Mexico. New Mexico got to vote for slavery. D.C. ended to buy and sell the slaves, but they got to keep what they had. Oh my gosh, caution, colored people. The Fugitive Slave Act is out there. Be careful. And that's it.